When speaking about the remains of ancient advanced civilization in Africa, everybody thinks about Egypt only. But there is much more than that. Let's visit a village in Ethiopia. It is called Yeha. The ancient ruins that are found over there show amazing uh, building quality. The sides of the stones or the geopolymer blocks are digitally perfectly even and smooth. They are polished. According to mainstream sources, these lands have been always inhabited by various very simple tribal cultures. And then how come we find these buildings of very high quality in what really looks like antique Greco-Roman style? The quality of this building work in this unknown village is much higher than that of the so-called supreme emperors of Rome, whose main palaces, supposedly the center of power, they are made of mud bricks. While this structure is made of big blocks, some of them reaching two and a half meters in length. Also, the building style of these megalithic structures, there are a few of them in Ethiopia, is very similar to these that are in Yemen. These photos are from Yemen, just for comparison. And by the way, it's absolutely the same in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. In Cambodia, in Turkey, in Peru, it's almost as if the same builder made them all. But this builder is not at all present in the current history of Ethiopia. Why is that? Now look at this single stone. What was it? The Twenty-some meters long. That is a gigantic. It definitely rivals the highest quality work uh, found in the Egyptian megaliths. And this is the actual quarry from where the mainstream historians assure us that uh, this stone was taken. Well, it is a completely different color. It is reddish. Uh, look at the megaliths. They are uh, whitish and uh, dark, like uh, black. That's not there at all in the quarry. Actually, the entire so-called quarry consists of small staircases cut in the rock. Not to mention the enormous obelisks in Exum, the capital of Ethiopia. They are much bigger than the famous Egyptian obelisks. And even with our so-called advanced technology these days, we cannot rebuild them to their previous glory. Not in one piece, anyway, as they originally did. We had to do it in pieces. We couldn't do it all at once. And again, not only the weight of the obelisks, but also the technology that was used in cutting them is uh, far beyond uh, the reach of any primitive tools, no matter how many millions of slaves were laboring for hundreds and thousands of years. These achievements are simply ignored by those who write the mainstream history. They do not mention them, pretend that they do not exist, and continue writing only about mud huts. In the past, the historians, the cartographers, they were well aware that Ethiopia belonged to this culture that now we mistakenly call Greco-Roman here. In an old medieval map of Ethiopia, we see a king who to us may seem at the wrong place, but if we believe what we see in terms of ruins instead of what the penguins tell us, then everything falls into place. Another interesting point to consider is that the megaliths of Ethiopia are made of stone that is not available locally. The nearest place where such stone can be found is Egypt. When a group of Russian researchers visited the nearby quarries where the mainstream historians tell us and assure us that the stone was taken from, they were surprised to find out that the stone over there has nothing to do with that stone that is used in the actual megalithic sites. So it's either artificially made stone 
which we call geopolymer, or it has been transported over thousands and thousands of kilometers from Egypt or somewhere else, which is, of course, not a problem for technologically advanced civilizations that can fly heavy cargoes anywhere in the world, but it's highly problematic for primitive tribes that supposedly lived in the territory of Ethiopia. Here we go. This is another interesting medieval map. Again, we see some sort of Caucasian ruler. The megaliths in the capital of Ethiopia, Aksum, are also very, very interesting. It's a mixture of perfectly shaped megalithic blocks, hard stone, and the very primitive old stone work as well almost as if two teams were working side by side. And that could have very well been the case. Just see. They are mixed. It's not that the primitive was made on top of the better, older foundation. And this is a pretty good example here. It seems that the survivor builders were putting their megalithic polygonal blocks this is the same like Peru, but this is Ethiopia, but it looks like Peru, or Turkey, or Japan, absolutely the same. Look at this, same polygonal masonry, no gap between the stones, huge sized blocks, so these are the survivors, and then the rest, the rough, low quality work beside them, is the work of the simple tribal people that were building alongside them. Or at least that's one of the possible scenarios. Another possibility is that initially the full building was of high quality and it got destroyed later on. And then the tribal people tried to repair it themselves. Now, here, another parallel with the megaliths of Yemen. They basically look identical to those in Ethiopia. The building style, the blocks, the size, just the same. And we're back to Exum. The familiar megalithic underground tunnels, enormous blocks of very high quality work. Everything is so polished, even the sides that do not show. The sides that are facing other blocks, they are also polished to perfection. That is why there is no gap. There's no mortar between the stones. And, as usual, we see the survivor's style clamps as everywhere else in the world. Here, even the original metal has survived. The connection between the culture that I call the nature people, the survivors, and the ruins in Ethiopia is not confirmed just by the style, but also by the writing found on those ruins. Now we call them European runes and Slavic runes, but apparently they were not exclusive to that region, so again the name given by the mainstream historians is not really suitable. Here we are still in Ethiopia and we see a very familiar symbol. In the previous episodes we saw it on the headwear and other symbols of the Japanese samurais of Lord Shiva in India, on the flags of the native nations of South and North America. Of course, it is all over the flags of medieval kingdoms in Europe. They all belong to the same culture. That's why the building style is the same. And the symbols are the same everywhere. And by the way, the village where the megalithic ruins are found is called Tieha, probably for the same reason for which one of the Japanese islands was called Yesu. The famous rock-hewn churches of Lalibela, again Ethiopia. 
the elders still tell the story that in the past angels of other races used to join their religious processions and how were the churches made that's a lot of work by the way the people used to work during the day and at night the angels used to do the work and it seems that this group of angels wasn't that independent after all because it cut the symbols of the survivors again on the walls of the churches according to the locals the king during whose reign these churches were made used to travel in altered states of consciousness and in those realms he was in touch with the angels under whose guidance the churches were made the passages around them are quite deep and at places some 15 meters wide that's a large volume of stone very unlikely to have been cut by local tribes especially within the very short span of a couple of years during which the churches are considered to be built if we take the traditional story about the help of the angels then the full story is much more believable especially taking into account how fast they were allegedly built 